step into the unknown and do something sometimes without knowing how the outcome will be. There is nothing exciting about a safe bet or the middle of the road. If you're not on the edge, you're taking up too much space. find uh, the strength to uh, overcome the challenges ahead. There's an incredible human being left for you to discover once you reach the edge. If you want to make a difference in life, be a scientist. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, may I please have your attention? We will begin our talk shortly. Thank you very much for joining us today on the session on imaginative artificial intelligence at the edge. Some years ago, Stephen Hawking said about AI, I believe there is no big difference between what can be achieved by a biological brain and what can be achieved by a computer. It therefore follows that computers can, in theory, emulate human intelligence and exceed it. Imagination is one of the fundamental concepts of human intelligence. It allows us not only to produce the artistic works of music and art, but also imagine the unseen. Our speaker today, Professor Mohammed El Hosseini at Kaos, will challenge and inspire us on the subject of imaginative AI, AI that can see, create, and feel. So can we create the AI that can imagine the unseen? Here to introduce our today's speaker and moderate the session is Dr. Jisoo Lee, the director of the Supercomputing Core Lab. The talk will be one hour long with 15 minutes of Q&A. Please join me in welcoming our moderator and our speaker today. Thank you so much. OK, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, so thanks for the session. Uh, uh, I'm really pleased to introduce the, our distinguished speaker here, uh, Professor Mohammed El Hosseini. And with the, all the things going on about like chat GPT and AI, I mean, we want to know more about that, right? Uh, so he he's an assistant professor at SMC, uh, and we are lucky to have him here. Uh, so he was has, he's received his PhD at Rutgers in the area of the computer vision, especially on efficient multimodal learning with limited data. And after that, he went to really nice places. He went to Stanford and Baidu and uh, Facebook, now is Meta. And he was re his work, work was recognized in many places. For example, that his zero-shot learning work was featured in United Nations. <laughs> that's, that's something, right? Uh, and also is in, in an MIT Tech Review and New Science Magazine. I mean, I can go on and on, but I mean, I think it's better for, for, for me to cut short and just hear directly from the Mohammed himself. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, please. Thanks, Sergio, for the nice introduction. I'm pleased to be with, uh, with you today. And um, I'd like to discuss with you the, a topic that I have been really uh, excited to be working on for the past decade, um, imaginative AI. And I would like to, to discuss with you today 
uh, how this can push the boundaries of AI on, on, on building assistive technology that can augment and improve our lives in many different ways. It's not just an idea, it's, it's not just a specific application, but it's a specific machine learning and AI paradigms that can uh, shift the, uh, the boundaries for many applications. So um, all, all of us maybe have heard about in AI in certain ways. This is one of the illustration, like popular illustrations for what AI is. More partic in, in particular, I would like to focus on uh, a, a very successful se subsection of AI called deep learning. It's the, uh, the one that have driven a lot of the breakthroughs that have been uh, like, uh, ex uh, uh, achieved recently. Um, and, and the way, the idea behind deep learning is if you have, for example, a visual recognition system, you have an image of a cat like this, you feed it to a neural network that poses it similar, very similar uh, to the way uh, our brain works through a set of layers. The earlier layers will just uh, understand small pieces like what uh, ages of the image and maybe uh, some modules will understand uh, where, where the eye is, where the ear is, etc. And at the end of the day, you will have a set of LEDs. And these LEDs are the set of categories that you care about. And if you train this, this neural network, you have more like knobs. These knobs are things that you turn and change during training so that the, mo the module, this, this neural network, can train how to classify an image of a cat to a cat category, an image of a dog to a dog category, etc. And these are present the set of categories that, you, that, that are predefined, and each one would have a corresponding LED. And you will train this model to switch, to turn on its corresponding LED. That's how learning works in this, this, this type of uh, uh, neural networks. So this is how it works uh, for cats, for dogs. But uh, imagine that you want to build an AI system that goes really beyond everything you have seen. Uh, maybe this kind of paradigms won't, won't won't be uh, like uh, won't be uh, the right choice anymore. So if you look at this uh, and imagine that we have in our planet uh, more than 7.7 .7 million animals, right? And almost 90% of those are not discovered yet. So we have less than 1 million uh, species that has been cataloged. And people who work on behavior ecology and, and species discovery are trying to recognize and understand the differences between whatever you see and encounter in life and try to, to do some checks to see if this is a new species or not. So there's a lot of things that we haven't yet uh, known and existing technology that are based on this specific vocabulary or a fixed vocabulary or objects would no longer work. Uh, so we need assistive technologies that, that are novelty aware, that can understand that something has been seen versus not. So. So this is what we want to achieve. That according to nature, this is, this is a, a dilemma. And this means that we need, like, in order to discover new species, we need people to go uh, check trap cameras uh, in forests and expl explore things, uh, put cameras underwater and explore if there are any kind of new species. But this, it, it will become soon uh, easy to realize that this won't scale. We need some assistive technology that, so that we can accelerate species discovery, for example. So what I wanted to share with you today that this is a more like a high level view about what existing machine learning paradigms can do. The, what you see in the left is, is uh, like a, 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 what's called supervised learning. Imagine just a classifier that can, can classify between cats and dogs, but this might scale to 1,000 species, but you still remember you have only fixed number of LEDs. And you cannot determine how many LEDs you have because you don't know how many species exist, right? So this kind of module ha is limited by design. So we need something better than that. Uh, supervised learning is actually the same thing, but you, you have still fixed a number of LEDs. And, uh, and, but you assume that you have some images are not labeled. It still won't work. And a third uh, paradigm is assuming that you have a set of images and you want to learn a good learning representation. But at, at the end, you still assume that you have a stage in your training where you, 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 you build your system based on a fixed number of LEDs. So it's not open vocabulary similar to our uh, reality, right? So through this talk, I'll, I'll just share with you some of the areas where imaginative AI it can be helpful. And what I mean by imaginative AI is an AI system that can learn beyond a fixed vocabulary of things. It's really open. And we wanted to explore the creative space of different domains. And one of these domains is recognition, creativity, 
self-driving cars, uh, recognition, and this is what I, what, what I refer to as uh, emotional well-being as an application of that as well. So imagine to see in connection to the species discovery. Now we know that the limitation of existing system with this fixed number of LEDs, uh, how can we approach a system that can recognize things that it has not seen before, right? So one way to do that is to describe them. So maybe many of us here, or many people here, do not know this category, right? Like parakeet But if I describe that to most of you and say that this is a bird that has an orange beak and the plumage is dark above and white below, you start to imagine it, right? And you don't have in your brain a lead, but you, you maybe just created it right now. And that lead will turn on if you just see the relevant bird among these four choices, right? It's really an easy task for most of us, right? So this is the bird that has uh, uh, like an orange peak and has a plumage that is dark above and white below, but we just learned that right now, right here, right? It's a not something of how can we build machine learning techniques that have a similar skill like that? So it needs to learn how to imagine this because this is what we did right now. We just take this language description, imagine how this may look like, and we may, if we, when we may encounter a species like this, we can tell, hey, this is the one that, that, that match our thought. This is the, the one that matches our imagination, right? So why this is important, like as we discussed earlier, like we, we, if we encounter a bird out, and out of nowhere it flies away, and in, in, in some other situation we, we may face like a, a, another species appear, but, out of, but in, this, in this case we have to fly away, otherwise we could be a meal for it, right? From biodiversity perspective, and like the, the, the context that the United Nations care about, we care about the, both the bird and the bird, and recognizing them and identifying what they are and where they are, so that we can keep counting those species and see what among the seen species are that, that could be in danger, right? And in, in the species discovery space, we need machine learning system that can, from the description, tell that this is something it has seen, or this is a description of something new. So how can we, uh, like, uh, how can we, uh, like, interact with this technology? Imagine that this is uh, Adam, like, as a, as a kid that, that just saw the bird that, that fly away, and you, you have, it is interacting with this AI that loves the environment, and it asks, it just says that I saw a bird that have an orange peak, the, uh, and the, but the AI system thinks that this is not enough information. Maybe it will start to ask more and more questions about how the bird looked like, how the, uh, like the blemish looked like, how the beak looked like, how the body looked like, until it's certain about what we really mean. And this can help identify species, and then maybe the, any one of us who might not be a subject matter expert can help identify those species, and this will, uh, will help us grow our knowledge about what we have in our plant right now. Right? So this is how, actually, uh, this is the motivation behind the problem. One of the key uh, methodologies that are successful in this space is called, uh, that is based on, actually, explicit imagination. So imagine that you have, a, a, like, a system, and this, that this is represented by this brain, and this can imagine how this bird looked like, uh, an unseen bird looked like, based on a language description that we just saw, right? If we build this, this imaginer so that it's accurate and it's matched the, the given description, we will have a mapping for each one of these species, the description, to a visual representation of this category that we hope to, to be able to tell apart those unseen classes from also seen ones. And the better the, the model on, on, on generating a visual representation of those unseen classes from that imaginer, from, then the better it will be capable of producing, of, of recognizing unseen classes. And hence, it might accelerate uh, like, uh, uh, understand species discoveries, for example, because it will be more novelty aware. It can, it can recognize that this is something I, had, I haven't seen before. So the, the system is based on, 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 a, uh, on a, <coughs> a learning mechanism that is based on two players. One player is an imaginer, and the other player is a judge. That can that can tell uh, apart. This is Im this image is generated by an imaginer or a real image. So it's trained. The, this uh, imaginer is trained so that it tricks the, discrimi tra the discriminator uh, or this judge to believe this image is as real as, as it can possibly be, and at the same time predict the the class that it belongs to. 
So if and if we do this simple mechanism, the model will be able to to uh, to uh, succeed or uh, outperform state of the art by significant margin. And the only difference between this class of models and previous methods that it was designed with an explicit imaginer in the in the in the in the learning system itself. Existing techniques before it, or di but don't have an explicit module that imagine how an unseen look, uh, class look like based on just the language description. Right. So this is this is one way or one uh, like domain where imaginative AI can help. But this is this is not the only domain where imaginative, explicitly modeling imagination imagination can be helpful. One of the things that we know as uh, as that imagination is a key element of our uh, intelligence as humans, right? And it helps us like, create uh, novel art, novel music. We are also hungry to see new things, and we hope for, we hope these new things to be interesting and novel and, and and something we like. So, how AI can be helpful in accelerating content and novel novel content creation? This can be applied to novel art, uh, novel uh, uh, music, novel fashion. So uh, I'm, I'm introducing you here to creative adversarial networks. This is a, 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 a neural network that we uh, developed a few years ago. Uh, like actually, the first version of it was developed five years ago, and it's trained to explicitly build uh, a, a generator and imagine that produce artwork that that is not that generates art that, that that's not seen before, that does not belong to any you know, of the existing uh, art styles. So how can we produce, uh, how can we train an AI system that can generate images that belong to a novel style? So this means that the model itself needs to be novelty aware. The model itself was based on uh, a principle of least effort by Colin Martindale, who is a Canadian psychologist. The x-axis here is novelty and y-axis is likability. So as you can see here that as novelty increases, people will start to like the work more and more. But after some point when the work is too novel to understand, such lack of understanding will lead to lack of appreciation. So the point here from machine learning perspective, how can we build an AI model that pushes the boundaries so that produces something that is not similar to things that it has seen before, but not too novel to, to fall into that negative hedonic range? We want to produce something that we can, it, it, it's easy for us to relate to, all right? So, if we, build, we use existing system, it can produce a picture like the Mona Lisa again. But this is not what we want. We want the model itself to be rewarded of generating something different. So how can we do that? We add an explicit teaching signal that tells the model, hey, when, when you produce the Mona Lisa, uh, give it a low reward. Give it a penalty. Don't do that. This is something that is not new. I don't want to generate something like that again. If it produces something new, it, it gives it more reward. But this, this reward is based on having this generated image not to deviate too much. So it, it, it tries to encourage this model to be more like a novel combination of existing concepts rather than something that is totally, totally unrelatable to existing concepts. And this is based on this like wounded curve that we just talked about earlier. We need some balance between producing something novel and also relatable so that we can understand it. We, won't, we never, would never appreciate something that we don't understand, right? I like so, it. It's really cool. So who painted it? A machine. It's actually the first work of art made by AI to be sold at Sotheby's. Sorry, I'm late, Dana, I got caught up. So th this is some uh, one of the art pieces that uh, that uh, HBO, like Silicon Valley, have purchased fr from us back then. Uh, fr that was produced exactly from this method that I just described. Um, and these are some uh, additional examples that were created by the same method at, at that time that uh, that draw attention from major media like uh, uh, um, magazines like MIT Technology Review and MIT uh, and, and, and New Scientist Magazine and uh, among others. Uh, this method was was like a few years or five years ago. Uh, this year we developed a better version of it, and this we call this creative walk adversarial networks. Uh, the um, the one of the key if you look at this uh, for example, you can see that the image quality is much better than the version that we just described, right? 
uh, that was just showed, the, the earlier version, Creative uh, Adverse Hand Networks. And if you look at the images on the right, the images that are on, on orange are the images that are generated by the method. Uh, and, and corresponding to each image are the nearest neighbor images in the training set. It w the, the point behind this uh, like figure is to show that nearest neighbor images are very different from, from each one of these instances. So this, this means that these generations are, are truly different and truly novel. Because even the closest image of it are, are, looks very different. How does this new method work? Uh, imagine, imagine that you are trying to build a generator to produce the images that are represented by these orange points. And all the time during training, you are generating images that are popping up on the right. So you are trying to, what we did exactly is to build uh, a system that during training sample a set of images like the one on, you see on, on, on the right. And you, you, we uh, developed a mechanism called creative walk. What does creative walk mean? It's a teaching signal that is aware of the existing set of images at all at once. So in CAN, we have a novelty loss for, that is operating on every single example. But differently, this learning mechanism tries to walk through these generations that are happening uh, iteratively, and it tries to, to start from seeing classes, walk through the gen generated novel examples that you are generating at the current time step, and encourages them this, uh, this, the result of this random walk to be hard to relate to any of the existing art styles. And think of this as a, a deviation signal or a novelty score that, that the model is trying to give for the set of images that have generated at once at, this, at the current time step. Once you do that, you keep repeating the process again and again. And at the end, the result will be a set of images that are novel, not, that are not only novel, but also diverse. Be why? Because this creative work mechanism encourages this set of orange points to talk to each other and to be collectively diverse and, and different from seen art styles. All right? So this is how it looks like. And, and the results of that is that we built a model that beat the state of the art at, at, uh, at that time on generating images that are different. Because the x-axis here is novelty score, how different the generated images are from, from the training set. And the y-axis is how much people will like the generated art. So the model tends to produce something that is more novel and more likable. And you can see that it, it quite uh, approximate the wounded curve that we, we discussed earlier, right? Generate something that is novel, more likable, but don't deviate too much. So uh, we also evaluated how this art works, novel artworks are capable of constructing emotional experiences for people. So how meaningful it, it can be. So we asked people to rate their emotion, to see given a generated artwork, if they have some feelings towards it. So people can pick hey, uh, among, fo among four positive emotions, including amusement, or contentment, excitement, anger, disgust, fear, and sadness, and see if actually any of those, uh, and also they can choose other or something else if they don't see any meaning in the generated image. And surprisingly, we found that this, like a huge distribution of emotions that are constructed by people based on these generated artworks. Uh, this is an example, for example, of, of generated artworks. And, and people actually argue why they felt uh, that way. So they describe in, in text, like, for example, the, the picture on the left, sunset uh, piece that is super relaxing, uh, great piece with animals, trees in the background. So people can relate and construct emotional experiences based on generated artworks. Uh, they are also quite diverse. So, for example, here, fear, emotional experiences, some relate to zombies, some other relate to ghosts, and things like that. <laughs> so the, the, the point of this is to show that actually our, we, we can have technology that produces visual stimuli that might actually uh, uh, influence or, or our uh, constructed emotional experience, uh, and so on. So now I would like to share with you that these two actually influence each other, imagining to create novel content and imagining to see. Um, 
And this is done by just relating this wounded curve, the very wounded curve that we just discussed, from uh, a species discovery perspective. Let's think about it this way. So if you look here at the as x-axis is the ability of the model to produce uh, learning representation of novel classes that we have never seen before. And if the model is producing only seen classes, it will be the, all the generations or all its imagination will be on the far left. And hence, the model will never be capable of imagining new things. And this is something that we don't want. As the model trying to produce uh, image, like visual generations, given the description of a novel class, it will push the representation to be different from, from seen classes, which is a vocabulary that we have learned so far in our life. But we don't want these visual generations to be, to be very different. Why? Because we, we still learn it, uh, a concept like an orange peak from, from brachid oaklet and crested oaklet. These are two similar oaklets. And they have orange peak. And they have, both of them have a dark plumage. So we don't want to push the, the imagination too far to disable transfer from the knowledge that we have from seeing classes to unseen ones. So I'm describing it at, here at uh, like a higher level. But imagine that you go from there and then derive a machine learning signal that explicitly tries to do that with, hey, give this imaginer a description of an oval class. Imagine that you have an oval bird that have a curved feather from the top of its head and has an orange peak. And it will try to produce visual regenerations of the class it has never seen during training. And it wants to teach the model uh, to, to produce visual generations that make them distinguishable from the vocabulary of birds that you have seen so far. All right? So this, this improves the model ability to distinguish between these two bursts significantly. So uh, think about species discovery, right? Our knowledge today is diff very different from our knowledge 10 years ago. So if we want to imitate it an, a, a true learning system that is similar to our skill, we need a model that learns continually over time. So what you have seen now is less compared to what you, you know a year later, right? So if you if you imagine that this is the this is you, this is this AI system at the current time step, these are the set of categories I've seen so far. We wanted to explore this region of crested oaklet because crested oaklet is yet to be seen. It has not something that we have seen at this time step. Um, later, when we when crested oaklet becomes part of our knowledge, we have seen it, right, and recognize it. The 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 set of um, concept that we want the model to explore and imagine will be different because the model will try to explore something new, right? So this same make creative work learning mechanism, we have adapted it to this very problem. And we also found that it can improve the model continual ability to discover unseen classes, all right? So and this, this is showing the performance of this model of uh, over time of how it's capable of recognizing seen classes um, and distinguishing from unseen ones in a dynamic distribution of seen and unseen classes that changes over time. Um, so this is the, the, uh, the seeing, the creation, driving, same thing. We have built a, a model that can learn how to predict the set of uh, a trajectory of the car over time. And we wanted to hallucinate driving uh, intent so that the model is, uh, is capable of, uh, of recognizing unseen uh, at, at plausible trajectory for the self-driving car uh, better, <coughs> better than uh, other systems. And by, by building this hallucinative uh, intent that imagines different uh, trajectories of the self-driving cars, we managed to improve the performance over existing methods by more than 50% for the road boundary violation, which is the ratio, of, uh, uh, ratio by which the car hit the road boundaries. So it's 50% much, it, more safe. And also, the, uh, uh, there is 20, more than 27% reduction in the final displacement error, which is basically how much you shift from the final place where the car should be. All right? So feeling is, uh, is, is, is something um, also different. 
So we have also explored how we can build AI systems that can that that are more compatible with our emotional being, right? So we are we all talk about how do we build a creative uh, or how do we build AI assistive technology that can interact with us, but we don't have much exploration of building AI systems that are more com that are compatible with our emotional being. And by emotional being, I mean something like, for example, if we have an image of, uh, let's say, a city, I can say something like, uh, this is a picture of a beautiful city. I can imagine myself sitting by the, by the water listening to the birds. So this is a description that perceives the image. And after that, you reflect on the constructed emotional experience that you have based on perceiving that visual stimuli. All right? So how do we build this AI system? We have a journey that, that is more than two two years so far, to build this kind of technology in, in a way that, is, uh, that, is a, uh, that can express emotions in a language, given a visual stimuli. And also, we're trying to do that in a multicultural way. What do I mean by that? Our perception of the uh, distribution of emotion, possible emotional experiences may vary across different backgrounds and culture. So to, to to relate this to different, like to, to the background, one thing I want to acknowledge is that uh, this book is how emotions are, are made by Lisa Feldman. She was trying to, to talk about uh, the theory of constructed emotion. So if you have an image like that, it's a punch of blob. But if you look at the, the, the picture, the colorful version of it, you, as soon as you recognize that this is a snake, this is not only telling you that it's a snake, it also constructs a fear, for example, emotion. And she's, her claim is that this constructed emotions happening at the moment. There is no specific neuron in our brain that relates to specific, uh, specific uh, emotions. We constructed uh, on the fly. Um, so to see the difference between what, what, what most AI system and what we have, what have, what we have tried to build so far, uh, look at the images on the top versus the bottom. Both of them about, are about birds, but one is, uh, is affection aware and one is just ob objective description of what's happening in the image. For example, uh, you can see the picture on the, on the, on the top, uh, on, on, the, on the bottom, for example, a bird is sitting on the table drinking out of a cup, uh, out of a, cup a small bird on top of a book page, but the picture on the, on the top is more like, uh, this is a, a water painting uh, of, a, uh, of a city. I can imagine myself uh, li sitting by the water listening to the birds. Uh, this, makes, this picture of a bird makes, makes me feel that birds are flying over my head. So this is how we, uh, we, we, we collected this data set. We used the same interface that we just described earlier. We collected more than 455,000 uh, utterances of constructed experiences from, from many people. Uh, and this enables us, for example, to, to build AI system that can describe images with affection. Uh, this is a distribution if, of, for example, emotional experience that we have, we have uh, collected. We have an improved version of, of it that, uh, that mitigates, for example, price. We, we found, for example, there is emotional balance, uh, imbalance here. For example, there are more, much more images of content versus, uh, versus fear, for example, or anger. So we balance it that with a second version. And uh, very recently, we, we got to the point that we wanted to build systems that, that, that are not only biased towards the, like Western culture. This we built we built the data set initially based on only English. So we want the model uh, to be more culture to be more cultural uh, culturally diverse. So we collected uh, uh, data sets that that have multiple language like uh, Engl uh, Arabic, for example, uh, like uh, French, uh, etc. And that led to our very recent work called Atrialingo that uh, we published recently in one of the uh, major natural language processing conferences. <coughs> so the, the difference is that we have for each one of these visual stimuli a description from Arabic speaking person, from English speaking person, from, from a Chinese speaking uh, uh, person. So we can know uh, how the AI system would behave uh, based on these different backgrounds. Um, so uh, like for example, if you look at this image, uh, it, it constructed for from Arabic speaking person contentment for for English and Chinese it was sad because this picture represents dry weather 
and, and uh, in, in Arabic Bedouin, if an Arabic Bedouin drew, grew up in a dry climate, this is something that he actually used to and he actually appreciated. So this is more, more constructed of emotional experience for Arabic culture, but maybe not so much for the, uh, for the English and Chinese speaking culture. Um, so in total, we collected more than 1.2 million uh, constructed emotional experiences over these three languages, English, Arabic, and Chinese. And based on that, you can actually build a system that can, given an image, produce the distribution of emotional experiences that can be constructed for each one of these background. And not only that, it can also speak about it. it like, for example, this, uh, this is a multicultural image captioner that takes an image, uh, a particular emotion, and also what culture you want to, the model to, to behave as if it is from this culture. And it will produce something like this. Like, I love everything about this painting of, of a mother and her uh, two uh, children lovely interacting with the cat. Uh, interestingly, we also did some analysis of a model that is trained to do like, like th this is an output of, of an AI system that predicts what are the constructed emotions based on the input text. So for example, if you look at the, uh, uh, the text description on the bottom, you can see countless babies have descended in, in this world, giving life to the, the world and making people feel happy. All cultures agree uh, that they feel content towards, towards the babies. For example, in contrast, other, an, an, another uh, like text description, the man looks like he is drunk, for example. This is, this is more likely to construct a sad for Arabic culture, but not as much for the English and the, uh, the Chinese. Because by, the culture is very different, right? So, and so on. So this is the main point of this uh, data set, is to understand our differences and how we perceive the world differently and how, how, this, how the uh, emotional experiences that are constructed can vary across different cultures. So it may relate more to understanding cross-cultural psychology or cultural psychology better than, what we, the, better th than our knowledge right now. Um, so we, are, we, we released uh, our data set for, for academic use, so you may check it out if you are interested. Um, now I have uh, just a, a couple of minutes to discuss the future, like how this technology, we have made some, some uh, uh, progress, but we think this is a few percent of the journey. Uh, if you uh, are following the media, you will see something, uh, well, you have, probably might be aware of, of the uh, system that Meta have developed called No uh, Language Left Behind. So they build a, a very large scale uh, translation uh, system that can translate between 200 languages, right? <coughs> so, and the point behind that is to build a more inclusive like technology for that, that cover uh, people from different, from different uh, backgrounds. But imagine, imagine that you, we want to build uh, a system that is more grounded to, to vision, right? So translation system is not visually grounded. It's not, it's not vision aware, right? It's not constructed to a particular visual content. So imagine that you want to extend this, what we just described, which covers only three languages, Arabic, Chinese, and, and English, to 200 languages. This is much more difficult than, 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 than translation, because translation, you have you have the same thing and you have translated literally from one language to another. It's a literal translation. But you cannot trans translate emotions. The, the distribution of possible emotional experiences given the same image is very different from people from different backgrounds. So you ha need to collect data in order to scale a system that is, cultural, that, that, that is massively culturally aware. You need to, to build, uh, to approach it in a very tricky way, I would say. Um, so this, is, this can be a future. We have also worked recently on building a dialogue system of this. Um, imagine that you have an image and two people have, have a disagreement on how they feel towards this image. So they might have 10 turns to describe, to, to, to interact and ask questions about this image. Till at the end, the, a questioner uh, will, they have two roles, questioner and answer. The questioner asks the question and answer answer the question, and the goal is at the end of the conversation, the questioner will decide on what emotional experiences have been constructed based on the conversation. 
So at the end, we have more than 30,000 uh, like dialogues. Each one of them would lead to a, either a positive or a negative experience. This means what? This means that with this data, we can build AI models that can, the AI bots, for example, that are trained to make people feel in a certain way. So you can train the system with a policy, with a reward function that makes you feel good. And this might have some amplification in emotional health, for example. So we are right now work, working in developing this to push the frontiers also of this in emotional health with, with, uh, with, with uh, medical experts. So this is, this is something uh, we can, uh, we have, have developed. You can also think about this from content creation. Can we create visual content that is affection aware? Um, can you have, can you, can you do some applications of that or build technology for this that can accelerate content, affection aware content creation in the metaverse as well? Um, how can you get to the world scale? So we have developed systems that can recognize unseen classes, but we have millions of, of species. That's the scale that we are, but we currently don't have a technology that can, can work in that large scale. This is also an open question. Uh, drug discovery, right? So I'm giving credit here for Anuj Daja, who, is, uh, who has uh, uh, worked on a project, in a course project in a deep generative model class that I, I teach actually in the spring. Um, and the point here that most of, uh, one of the key problems is that in drug discovery is drug protein interactions. So, so we need to find the drug sequence that binds with a particular drug because most of the diseases, for example, think, think about drug uh, protein as a lock and, and a drug is a key. And you want to find the key to the given protein because this, what def this, this are typically what define a, di a, di a disease, right? If you build an AI system that, is, that, that learns about from, from all our uh, like knowledge, medical knowledge of what proteins and drugs bind and what proteins and, and drugs that don't bind, you will have an AI system that can generate and make suggestions of the possible drugs same way you, uh, you, it, it, will, it is capable right now to predict like, uh, uh, answers with ChatGPT, which if, if most of you maybe have heard about ChatGPT, right? You, you can ask it some questions and then maybe it answer you, like what, who are the top scientists in, in AI, who are, uh, give, give me a solution for, for, this, uh, for this problem, or uh, answer this, uh, uh, like, uh, write an essay about Barack Obama or something like that. So from this knowledge, think about the difference here is not, is not translation from text to text, but translation here is from protein to a drug sequence. So this might help us save a lot of time to, to generate drug sequences that are more likely to succeed in clinical trials. <laughs> so this is like this is one of the like the, the systems that Anuj have, have built in the in the in the uh, in the class, and I wanted to conclude by this uh, like slide from uh, Jacob uh, Oskars, who who have like right now left Google, who uh, he's one of the uh, popular machine learning scientists in natural language processing, and he is right now inventing what he calls uh, biological software. So. Computer software, you write a code, you give it a compiler, you predict, you, you, you generate a computer software. Um, he, he's built a company called Inceptive that the goal of it is to write a code. It's still in the early stages. You, do not, you don't have even an, a demo at this mo moment. That you give it a code and it produces RNA, RNA molecules. Um, <clears throat> RNA molecules are, best, are, are known as the messenger between the like DNA uh, and, uh, and proteins, right? And they construct more than 90% of our genomes, right? So if you have solved this dilemma, maybe, maybe this will also open a lot of doors in, in accelerating drug discovery. And uh, uh, after, uh, like at the end, I would like to thank all the students who have, and collaborators who have been part of a lot of the work they have uh, uh, that presented today, and uh, uh, I wanted to conclude with that imaginative AI is, is more like a concept uh, of building AI's, AI models that can explore beyond the vocabulary you have seen during training, and it has shown some promise in understanding species discovery, 
content creation, self-driving cars, and emotional health, and maybe more. Uh, thank you so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the very, very interesting talk. I learned a few with you, really new things, and that's very unusual. Thank you again. Uh, so we'll take uh, take questions from the from the audience. Uh, anybody who want to have, have a question, that you can come to the microphone and ask. Yes, please. Okay, so thank you so much for the very I mean, amazing presentation talk. So basically I'm a pharmacologist and I was really so much attracted by the concept of the drug discovery using AI. So we actually had one of the compounds. It showed a very potent anti-cancer activity, but the problem was that the target was not really identified. So we went to, let's say, databases which were predicting a drug target interaction, but the problem is that since this compound was really novel, uh, we couldn't really find a fit. So you know when you get the list of the targets, there are some of the, um, let's say, the trusted targets, and others which had really little relevance or significance. So based on the model which you have building or your collaborators are building, I was asking whether it would be possible uh, if the target is really novel and there are no other um, sensitized or developed drugs against this target. Will the model or the AI be able to identify whether this compound will be able to fit into the target, or do you need for the model to work that you have uh, previously defined uh, compounds or ligands which already fit into the target? So that's the question. Okay. All right. Uh, first of all, I want to just have a disclaimer. Uh, I haven't myself working on drug discovery, but it's, this is something that I, I am excited to work on. I have been discussing this with, with some people who are, who are much more knowledgeable than me, but I, I'm here like trying to, to, to suggest the, the idea itself of imaginative AI, and I've explored it in this area, but not yet in drug discovery. Um, so one thing I can say from, from this, uh, this kind of AI learning approach, right? Is that if the solution can be related to this, the training set even compositionally, the model will be capable of doing a good job. Let me give you an example. Let's say in species discovery, this is a problem I'm much more familiar with. If you are describing a, a new species, but the components of this new species is something that you have explored uh, before, during, in, in the set of scene classes, the model will be capable of doing a really good job. For example, parkid oculid is, is a, a, like a, or crystal oculid is a class uh, that has an orange peak. You have seen classes before that have a peak, and maybe they ha they, they, you have seen, you, you have learned the concept orange. Maybe you have seen, or you have also seen the words wing, like maybe it has a black and white wings. So I have learning those individual components. Maybe the, the entire description, the composition of this particular, con, of this particular class is, particular, is, is unique. It's the only class, uh, species that have an orange peak and has a crested, crested feather that comes from the top of, of the head. But the individual components has, done, has, be, has been seen before. If you have something new whose components has never seen, been seen before, the model is less likely that to work. So you need, it needs at least to learn, to, to, to know the modules that compose a new concept. Thank you so much. I mean, that's really relevant to what we have seen with the established models. So we were never able to identify, let's say using the databases which use AI, the real target. So they always had, let's say, lowest level of significance. So even tried to test other drugs with known uh, relevant targets. So we saw that um, if, as you said, if it's already known and previously tested, then it has more relevance than something novel. So that's why we wanted, we were hoping that okay. hopefully with AI this would be it, overcome. It, 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 it can, it, it's not necessarily has to be seen before, but its modules, ha, it, it, it needs to be seen before. Its components. No, uh, no, I, that totally makes you, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Sorry. 
Um, very, very interesting talk. Um, with the uh, species identification, mm -hmm. what I didn't quite understand is, is how did you train the model? Did you, was it looking at text? You, you had Wikipedia open at one point. Was it yeah, looking yeah. at text and, and using that? Or, or does it look at images? And can it describe the images? It can it understand, you know, if I explain a description, it can match my description okay. based it, on the image or, or, or based on the text? Okay. Imagine those, like, we have right now less than a million animal, right? That, they, that are catalogs, right? So, we, and we could, we could have a language description for each one of these animals, right? So you consider those as training set, a, lang a language description per animal, and a set of images that are associated for every animal that has been cataloged so far. You feed that to a model uh, that trains on everything and tries to match, to, to match every language description, uh, to match images that belong to the same class, to the corresponding uh, uh, language description, and make that close to, to one another. And, 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 and make the, those that don't match language descriptions and images that do not belong to the same class uh, be distanced uh, to one another in the learning representation space. All right? So this is what you use during training. At this time, get, you, you have a language description of a new species, like one million plus one, category one million plus one. And you want the model to give an image to tell you if this, if this image, assuming that it belongs to the class one million plus one, the new, the new species, you want it to have the high similarity measure to the, to the, to the new class description than any of the other one million species that you have seen before, so that you can, you can match it to the right class. But remember that this new, new species is something that you have never seen an image for it during training. So you cannot use the, you can use, not use uh, any learning data for this class. You only have uh, a language description that describes it, and you want to see how successful it, it is to identify, to match that to, to that particular species and not any of the other million categories that you have seen so far. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, I have a question about uh, how easy to correct any uh, incorrect learning that the system might have had. For example, if uh, it's incorrectly uh, understood emotions from different cultures in a s certain way, how is it easy to backtrack and teach it something or tell it that this is, was done by mistake? For example, one of the species was feed as uh, it's already discovered, but it's not. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I think it needs to be more grounded. Like, for example, I think probably you're relating this to ChatGPT, for example. So it can make up stuff, right? It can you can talk, discuss proof that uh, uh, like uh, one is equal to two, and it can just make an argument as if it's a very and very confidently prove that one is equal to two. So this is not something that we we want. So I think if we have more like AI systems that are grounded to sources that can tell, hey, this is the argument, and what supports this is that reference in or that paper or that article, the more reliable uh, this technology would, would be. Um, so generally, in, when we have AI systems like similar to the, the one that, 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 that relates to cultures and, and, and how, how can we correct them, uh, think about the reinforcement learning. So you can, we need to have system, this system to have human in the loop so that you can provide it feedback to tell, hey, this is not, Right, uh, the right way is to is to uh, is to do it. This uh, this is not correct. The correct answer is Would X that be instead of Y. Uh, not fully unsupervised or uh, like semi-supervised, or how, how would you classify that type of uh, learning in that case? It's I would say it's more like reward-based, like reinforcement. You know that ChatGPT itself is based on human judgment. So, for example. Uh, ChatGPT is based on GPT-3, a language model that, uh, that OpenAI built earlier, so that given a uh, context, given a set of words, it predicts the next set, set of words, right? So ChatGPT is actually using the same pre-trained model. What, what, what did they do differently is that they trained it further on dialogue data, so it becomes more conversational. And it, this, this model by design can produce multiple answers. So let's say for every context, like uh, for, for every context, like someone interacting with this technology, 
the model that can, can provide 10 answers. And then they ask people to judge which one they favor the most. And you, they collect the hundreds of thousands of, or millions of these, uh, these responses from people. And they use this as a rewarding signal. Mm -hmm. So they trained GPT, they, they, they conducted another iteration of training to train GPT to produce the answers that is most favorable by people. This might not be the right thing, it can be arguable, because at the end of the day, chat GPT right now might produce an answer that could look, look convincing, but it might not be actually true. So it solved one problem, but introduced another one. I see. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So actually, I mean, actually, I have one question. You mentioned that, I mean, so there was a multicultural aspect, and different culture have a have a different uh, emotion associated with images, right? Uh, but so, but is there any kind of unique, kind of universal uh, emotion too? So I mean, so I mean, when you look at the, when you show the images to, let's say, multiple cultures, mm -hmm. is there a kind of common emotion that is uh, every culture is receiving, or is more on the more on the all the diverse? Uh, this is very, this is a very good question. The point actually is, this is a, we found some categories where people tend to agree. Like, for example, this, the, the, the example of babies, right? All, all, all culture agree that pe like babies is a good thing, like uh, construct, more constructive or positive experience. Landscape images. Like we actually, since we have responses for more than 400,000 people, 400,000 uh, responses for each culture, we can, we can actually measure the culture agreement for, and the inter-culture agreement for, for the, the images of most culture agreement and the images of least culture agreement. So but we found concepts like landscape uh, are more likely to, to, to be agreeable on. But let's say, uh, for example, uh, religious paintings, for example, can, can, can be different. So th there is a spectrum of less, the most agreeable, the most disagreeable, the most agreeable, and there is in between, so it's not uh, it's, it's not it's not uniform. So sorry, is this your research? I mean, that like all kind of what are the what are the kind of universal human emotion, right? Exactly. So the, the point is, how can we build a model that is capable of learning what is the possible distribution of emotions given a visual stimuli for every like culture? And maybe this can help in recommendation system, building, uh, like, you want to create, uh, let's say, uh, you want to put a chair in your house, right? But you want to create it so that it's more relatable to your culture. If you have an AI system that can, like, uh, that can uh, suggest uh, an affection aware, uh, like a chair, like create a chair that is, that, that, that is more matching to your background, this might make it more likely to produce something that you'd like to use. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you uh, again for for the for her Mohammed. Uh, I think there is a small uh, token of appreciation. Uh, so actually, personally, I learned a lot uh, during this like one hour talk, which is very unusual, and I'm pretty sure that many of you also learned too. So, it, this is a, like a real token of the what you have done for the for the community. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you today and, and to engage with, with everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah.